Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to RMSP and uh, uh, me, Doug Johnson, and I'm going to be talking about macro photography for this next half an hour or so. And I want to give a quick shout out to B&H and Canon for sponsoring this event, because without them, um, you wouldn't see me, and um, and that wouldn't be good. So, um, so hats off to those guys. Um, and uh, we're going to be when we talk about macro photography, we're really talking about close-up photography. Uh, macro is is defined by a certain um, uh, size, but we're get, we're just going to be uh, talking about how to get close up. And certainly for something like this, you probably don't want to get any closer than that. So we're we're not talking about this. Um, we're talking about getting close up to something like this. Um, so let's get close. It's uh it's opens up a whole new world and um, something that you don't normally see without um, you know using lenses and supplements to actually view things in a different way. And that's that's what's so exciting about macro photography, being able to enter that world um, of indifference and, and magic um, that we don't see with our own eyes without um, the use of equipment. So what is macro photography? Well, if we look at um, magnification ratio, which uh, macro photography is defined by, um, it is the ratio um, between two physical sizes of, of two different things, the real object and then what's on your sensor or what's recorded on your film. And um, we can look at the ratio in terms of these kinds of ratio numbers, um, one eighth life size, one quarter life size, one half life size, and, and life size, one to one. And that's truly, um, all these are close up, but macro photography um, is defined by the physical sizes of these two things as one-to-one -one or life size. And um, certainly you can get bigger than that, and that's also mac macro photography. Um, but that's how it's defined. And if we look at uh, what life size is, we look at this digital sensor with the, the penny in it, on it, um, and then we look at a penny, that, and that's the, re the real penny, then they're both the same physical size. And that's really where macro starts. And that's uh, um, where uh, macro lenses are defined by that because basically they can focus and get you can get close enough and focus so that, that those two, two physical sizes are the same. Um, and that's different than most lenses because most lenses you can't get that close. But we're going to also talk about supplements that will allow you to, uh, to put those in between the lens and the camera to get even closer than the lens normally would. So that's what we're going to talk about. But let's look at the, you know, some pictures in terms of these ratios. And so here's a picture of a uh, uh, yellow flower, uh, YF. I don't know what it is, so I just use uh, acronyms like that, YF, yellow flower. Um, so here's one eighth life size right here. And if we um, go to one sixth life size, we're obviously getting closer and the thing's getting bigger, one sixth. And we go to quarter life size. Um, and certainly now we're entering in, into a place that we uh, don't normally see in, um, with our own eyes. So here's half life size and we're getting really close. And then certainly when we go to one to one, we are now at life size. Um, and like I said, macro lenses will you allow to you to get that close and also supplements we're gonna talk about. So let's uh, shift, shift gears and talk about gear a little bit. The macro lens, um, we're going to discuss um, in, in a little bit of depth, and we're going to also talk about extension tubes, which are uh, little things that you buy to put between the lens and the camera to allow you to get closer, focus closer. We're also going to talk about close-up filters, which uh, you put on the front of the lens to be able to um, focus a little bit closer. And um, so let's look at the macro lens, um, which basically, um, when you focus as close as you can, the, all macro lenses go to one-to-one. -one. There's some exceptions, which we're not going to talk about, but most general macro lenses, you can, once you focus the closest as you can, now your, your image is life-size. And so um, focal lengths, um, they make different kinds of macro lenses in terms of the length of the lens. So 60 millimeter uh, macro lens, and um, when we focus as close as we can, the working distance from your subject is about three inches. So you're really, really close with that 50 or 60 millimeter macro lens. They also make 100 millimeter macro lenses. And now your working distance is a little bit further away. It's six inches away. Um, and then one more category um, of macro lenses, and, and that's your 180 or 200 millimeter macro. 
and now your working distance is about 10 inches. Well, what's the advantage of a working distance of 10 inches over a three inch working distance um, to get the same life size um, physical um, uh, image on your camera? Well, 10 inches is, uh, you know, about that far. And certainly if you're working with insects, um, they don't like to be bothered from three inches away. So if you do that sort of macro photography, maybe um, the longer focal length will, would be an advantage for you. Um, to be 10 inches away. And certainly the view changes a little bit too. Certainly a 180 is a telephoto, so you're a little bit narrower view and 100 millimeter a little wider and then 60 even wider. So that's a, that's a subtle change because you're so, so close, but it still might be important. So here's um, just a few slides of, um, of the macro lenses, the categories. There's a 60 right there, working distance of three inches. Um, a hundred millimeter macro at six inches, um, and then the 180 um, at a working distance of 10 inches. And you'll notice that this uh, 180 millimeter macro, what does it include there? It includes a foot. This is not a 180 millimeter macro, I don't own one, but you can see the foot on this um, particular lens. And this helps you basically put the, the whole rig, your camera body, and your lens more over the tripod so it's a little more a uh, little more stable and we're, when we're shooting macro we need to get everything as stable as possible in most situations so that um, you know we can get nice sharp pictures so this foot um, will allow you to do that the other thing to consider when you're thinking about a macro lens brands certainly differ a little bit here's a couple here's a couple brands this is a sigma lens and this is the one i own um, it's about five or five or six hundred dollars for this particular lens, and this is a hundred millimeter macro by Canon. Now they're both very good quality lenses. Um, in fact, a macro lens is going to be one of the sharpest lenses in your bag, um, in your toolkit, because they're fixed focal lengths. For one, there's no zooms when you talk about macro lenses, and also um, they're um, very fast. And um, so all macro lenses are. Uh, f 2.8 so all of them have that distinction and very fast but if you look at the dis differences between these two um, this particular lens when you focus to one to one its closest focusing range you can see that the lens barrel um, is uh, out and so it becomes a little bit longer and a little bit less stable whereas the Canon here um, it's internal focusing and so you don't get extension of the lens so you keep that with that consistent stability. But I just have to pay attention when I use my um, little Sigma here um, in terms of the stability. Um, and also you can see that it's 100 millimeter macro lens from the Canon has a uh, groove to allow you to put a foot on it. So you can actually get the foot here. It's, it's extra cost, but certainly um, it's gonna allow you to get the whole uh, weight of the camera and the lens more over the center of the tripod. Um, so that's uh, just a, a few words on uh, macro lenses and um, so now we're going to jump into the supplements and we're going to talk about extension tubes um, and close-up filters and I love extension tubes and here's why. Um, they are, um, they come in a set normally, you can buy them individually like from Nikon, but they come in a set and here's a set um, from Velo. And it's only uh, $90 for this set. And um, you have a 36 millimeter, so that's the dimension or the width of the particular tube. And these, these are called extension tubes. And they come apart. And they just go in between um, the camera and the lens. And they allow you to focus much closer. And they're, um, they're wonderful because you don't have to spend a lot for them because there's no... There's no glass in them. So glass isn't an issue, they're just straight um, tubes. And so quality is you don't suffer from quality. Um, and so let's put this on. Like I said, they just go between the lens and the camera. And there you have it. And it's certainly for this 50 millimeter lens, this has 48 millimeters of extension, which we're, we're gonna talk about what that means in terms of the magnification ratio. But what happens with the, and there's always a give and take with these things. With the um, extension tubes, you lose a little bit of light. 
um, in terms of the light has to pass through a further distance. So that's the only downside to the extension tubes. The more you put on, you lose a little bit of light. So that's, uh, that's a consideration too. Um, but certainly much cheaper than, um, than buying a macro lens. And let's see how these work in terms of the magnification. So if you take um, the extension, um, and the magnification ratio is determined by the extension length um, divided by the focal length. So if we put, um, to get a one uh, half life size or one to two ratio, you put 25 millimeters of extension behind a 50 millimeter lens and that gets you to one to two. If you want to get to one to one, it might be obvious um, that you would put 50 millimeters of extension behind a 50 millimeter lens. And now I'm at that really close focus, that sort of critical stage of being um, life size, one to one. Um, and certainly that's what I did here with this setup. I just put 48 millimeters of extension behind a 50 millimeter lens. And now we're looking at very, very close to one to one ratio. But they're beautiful. They're nice and solid. Everything is um, well built. And for 90 bucks, you can take a uh, inexpensive 50 millimeter lens. Most, most 50s are pretty reasonable in terms of their cost, 250 to 300 dollars. It, buy the extension tubes for 90 and then um, and then you're able to get to life size and um, Velo is is the B&H brand. Is that right? Yeah, yeah B&H brand and um, they're I love these things and they're only $90 So something to consider when you're thinking about a supplement to get um, If you want to get into this and you want to see if you like macro um, But you don't want to spend the five six hundred or fifteen hundred dollars on a true macro lens it's a good starter to get you into the, into, the, um, into the macro world, let's say. So, and certainly the more extension that you put on, the greater magnification that you achieve. Um, you, don't wanna put, um, you don't wanna put a lot of extension on, like 100 millimeters of extension on a 50 millimeter lens because the focus would actually be inside the lens somewhere you wouldn't be able to focus. So. Um, it, you might find that if you go nuts putting extension tubes on. Um, but here's an example um, of just some flowers I shot with a 24 millimeter lens. And then the next shot here is uh, putting 12 millimeters of extension on that 24 millimeter lens. And you can see that now I'm at one half life size, which is pretty nice. Um, nice picture of a flower. Um, and here I put 48 millimeters of extension. It was this setup right here. 48 behind a 50, and now I'm at one to one in the shot of the little pine cones. So extension tubes are great, something um, that you could, should consider even if you own a macro lens, because I can put this ex the extensions behind my macro lens um, and focus even closer. I can also put it put the extension behind you know my normal uh, like this 70 to 200 millimeter zoom. The focusing distance, working distance, as close as I can focus without the extension on this lens is about six feet. Well, what if I want to get closer? Well, it's easy. Just add some extension to it and you'd be able to focus even closer. And now I can start to work within three feet of the subject, bring things into um, my viewfinder and, um, and get closer to my subject, which is really fun. So lots of advantages and variability with these extension tubes. And, once again, in the world of photography, you don't find too many things that are cheap, but that's one of them, so that's nice. Um, the other uh, thing that's relatively inexpensive as well is close-up filters. And they're just uh, basically just like magnifiers that you used to use as a kid. Um, and they come in a set. Normally, this is a set that I got from um, B&H, Tiffin Filters. Um, and they come in a one, two, uh, one, two, and four strength. And um, I can use them in combination with each other, or I can use just one. It depends on how close I want to get to my subject. And they're just pieces of glass, and they run, they're under $100. So once again, another easy, um, easy and cheap way to get into, into the macro world with those. Um, but I would recommend the extension tubes um, first. Only because the quality, the sharpness that you get out of uh, use of the extension tubes is not diminished. Um, with these close-up filters, it, it provides a nice soft quality to what you're shooting 
because they're just pieces of thick glass that are are bent to provide the magnification. Um, so you'll see this in a couple uh, series of photographs here that I, I shot with these filters. And this is no filter. Um, and then I put on the um, number one filter. And you can see that it's even now it's a little soft, um, you know, around the outsides. The sharp, the center stays fairly sharp, but uh, gets a little soft um, on the edges. Uh, so here's a number two that I used and then a number four. So it's allowing me to focus closer and that's the name of the game here. Um, so here's an example. I shot a page out of a book with a no filter and you can see this is a hundred percent view down in the corner, the little side box um, right there on this, on the slide. And you can see it's pretty sharp on the left with no filter, but on the right with the number two close up filter used, you can see that it gets a little soft and, and fuzzy. And also you get a little chromatic aberration. Um, you can see it, uh, you know, in uh, the blue on top of the H and then the red underneath the H. So it is also giving you yourself a little chromatic aberration, which you can fix in, um, in Lightroom um, and or Photoshop and some other software um, after the fact, but um, certainly it's, you have to fix it. So it's a little more work on the computer for you. Um, but certainly if you don't mind um, the softness and you just want to get close to something, um, then these close-up filters are, are good. And a, lot, a shot like this of this little buttercup, um, nah, it doesn't matter whether the edges are soft. Um, it's soft already. So, so I use those occasionally as well, but normally I'm going to the, my extension tubes um, to use with different lenses. So that's the supplements. Um, and... So uh, those are a few options for you to consider. Um, and, uh, and like I said, look to B&H for these Velo extension tubes and it'll save you a lot of money compared to the Nikon and Canon brand. And they don't have any glass to them, so you're not losing any quality. Um, and the other thing that we have to consider when we're shooting macro, because we're getting so close and the magnification is so big, we have to consider stability. And so briefly, I just want to talk about close-up stability in terms of the camera. Um, and one thing that's going to help us get things really stable is a good tripod. Um, and so we're not going to get into tripods too much, but here's one. Um, and uh, certainly the thing to consider when you're considering a tripod is to make sure that the, the tripod goes down to the ground. Um, that might be a really important um, thing to consider when you're thinking about tripods. Um, so you can get all the way down to the ground. Another thing to help you with stability is a cable release. So this plugs into your camera, right? And now you can release the shutter button with the cable release. So you're not pushing on the camera. Because remember, high magnification when you get into the macro world, um, every little vibration from the camera or movement from your subject is um, exaggerated. So you want to try to ma minimize um, any kind of movement from the camera or the lens um, or yourself if you're um, hand holding. But, and a cable release will help you to do that. Another thing is uh, the lens collar. Like I discussed earlier with some lenses, that will help you get the balance um, and the weight centered over the tripod. Um, so a lens collar. And when other things, Another thing that we have to consider is stability of our subject. Um, so, oh, one thing I forgot um, is uh, raising the mirror. So uh, if you're a mirrorless um, user, uh, camera user, you don't have to worry about this. But with DSLRs, when you push the shutter button, the mirror raises and it actually will trigger some vibration in the camera. So um, I suggest that you use a mirror lockup on your camera and that's, most cameras will have that. Just look in your manual to find the mirror lockup feature. And then the mirror is locked up before you shoot and it won't vibrate the camera when you take the picture. Um, another thing that we'll discuss uh, briefly here in just a minute is using live view. Um, because when you go into the live view mode on the camera, your mirror is raised. So you don't have to worry about that vibration. Um, and live view is, is a wonderful feature on the camera for all kinds of reasons, which we'll, I'll discuss in a minute. But here's an example right here um, of the mirror um, two shots, which you really can't tell right now. 
um, which one is sharper. But as you start to look at things close, which you should look at your work really close, um, you're going to see that um, at 100%, right on this edge of this little pedal, um, with the mirror locked up, you can see that in that 100% view that the left image is just a little bit sharper than the right. And that's because the mirror lockup feature was used on the camera. So make sure you use that every time if you're not in live view um, and you'll get sharper pictures. And that's what we're all um, moving towards, working towards. So, but live view, what a wonderful thing. Not only does it help you um, with that, with the mirror lockup, but it also helps you with focus because you can basically zoom in to different parts of the image to get your focus really precise but it helps with composition because you can see you don't have to look through the eyepiece and a lot of uh, the viewfinder a lot of times your camera is in a place where you it's really difficult and if you're my age um, that's a little more difficult now than it was before um, to get down to my uh, my viewfinder so I love love live view for that also it helps you with exposure because you have the histogram um, it can also help with depth of field, um, so you can see what uh, using a certain aperture, what kind of depth of field you're getting. So, so many great things about Live View. If you haven't uh, haven't used it before, jump into it. For those of you who have, you probably know um, how important it is um, to uh, us as photographers. Um, and so, let's talk about close-up stability um, in terms of your subject. And um, certainly, when you go out, uh, it's rare that you go out on a day when there's absolutely no wind at all. So if you like to photograph flowers and plants and insects, um, things like that, um, you want to be able to, um, to stabilize those. So if you can see this little device, this is called a plamp. And uh, it's, it looks not kind of unruly, but it's a really in, uh, sort of an ingenious device um, because it has a little uh, clamp here that's soft. It doesn't, uh, you know, pinch little uh, little flowers and their stems or anything like that. So soft um, closure on it. It's articulated. Um, these are about $40. So once again, a really uh, sort of an inexpensive piece of equipment. And um, you can, you can um, actually poke your friends um, with it too. Um, but this end of it has a nice big clamp that you could put on your tripod or anything like that. Um, and then, um, and, uh, there it is. Excuse me, guys. I got I got the most important prop here. It's my flower. And so now, if it's a little windy, see the wind? Um, you can put this in here, <laughs> clamp it, and look how happy that flower is, not blowing in the wind. And um, then you can set up your camera and get the, sh the shot that you want. So that's called a clamp. And it's made by Wimberly, and you can also find these at B&H as well. So also um, we, we can also use, uh, you know, something to block the wind because like I said, it's always windy as you know that you go out there and, and um, so uh, they make things to block the wind. This is a diffuser, but it can also be used to block the wind and um, you could use your jacket or anything else, but uh, a windscreen might be helpful um, when you go out there as well. Um, string and stakes, I use those to um, supplement things that I can't use my plant for. And um, I'll tie little, and, uh, tie little things up with string and stakes into the ground. Or I can also move plants to get them out of the way of my shot so I can get exactly what I need in there. So I have a little string, uh, some uh, utility cord and stakes in my, in my um, backpack when I go macro shooting. So that's nice. And then certainly you want to pay attention to the forecast because you'd like to, you don't want to go out on the morning to shoot flowers with, the, with a, a, a high wind forecast. So pay attention to the weather. Um, and one thing about a weather forecast too, is that you can forecast uh, dew. Um, if the, if your forecasted low temperature and your dew point temperature are the same, well, then that's hundred percent humidity and dew will likely form. Um, so you can, um, you know, shoot little insects like this. And this little guy, look at his little arm is sticking out. I think he was waving at me. Um, so I named him Fred um, just for that purpose. Um, or if it's colder than uh, 32 degrees, you're going to get what? Frost. That's right. 
So another thing to consider. Um, and uh, so let's shift gears and talk a little bit about modifying light because one of the easiest things to do is to be able to change the, some of the properties of light when you're shooting macro because you're, you're sort of in control of this little environment that's in, in front of you. So one of the easiest things to use in terms of changing the property of light from hard, say a sunny day, to really soft, like a cloudy day, is a diffuser like this. And another thing that's pretty inexpensive to pick up that's really going to help you, um, not only can it do that, change the light, um, but it, you can also use it for a windscreen. So get a couple of these to carry along with you. Um, so here's just some examples. Um, when we talk about how light describes, because it's such an important part to photography, in this scene right here, pretty hard light. So it's uh, kind of loud and... Um, you know, your eye movement is pretty fast. You can even see in the background here, there's a little bit of light back there. Um, your eye movement is fast, so it can be described as exciting or bold or loud kind of light. Well, I like, I like most of my flowers shot with nice soft light um, because you can start to study the detail of things. So here's that same flower just using a diffuser to block the sun. And now I have a nice soft light shot. Um, and it's, you know, it's delicate, it's quiet, which um, I like with flower photography. I think, you know, there might be some flowers that, um, like uh, sunflower might be good in, in a nice hard light, but, um, but certainly some flowers, um, nice, like, uh, I like them in really soft light. And one flower I've never seen that looked good in hard light was an iris, so pay attention. Um, and here's a shot that, uh, uh, a sequence here with a really hard light from a light source and then um, with a diffuser just softened it up and if you look at these two shots considering if you were selling stock or something um, you're going to make m many more sales with this shot than you are with this shot because of the quality of the light you're able to study all the little details in this coin shot um, so here's another sequence with a tulip Nice hard light, and then with the diffuser, ah, nice and soft. Um, this little flower picture was shot with an umbrella, just placed on the ground. You can see the umbrella in the background, but it's softening the light of that really bright sunny day. And um, now you can study all the details in this in this uh, little um, little yellow flower. Um, one thing that's really really important. Um, and it's the thing that you should really consider first after you uh, define what your subject is, is the background. And that's why it's uh, on here three times, because that's how important it is. So when you go to set up, consider the background because it will, will alleviate um, all kinds of movement in the camera and maybe even going to a different subject. So you don't want to spend all that time getting all set up when your background is, is, is um, just not good. So, um, so here's a really uh, kind of a distracting background behind this flower. You start to lose it, lose the flower um, and its little stem um, because the background is, um, is not good. It's, it's, too, uh, it's too sharp, even though it's soft, fo soft focus back there. It might be an aperture a depth of field issue, but it's also maybe that the background is too close to the flower. So you might find a similar flower with the background that's further away and it would be softer. But the background's so important. And like I said, consider the background, define your subject, know what it is, and then start to look at the background first. So like here, these irises that are kind of done or passed, I thought they were kind of comical and whimsical. Um, so I set this up and certainly um, you can see down here in the lower left corner, um, a little uh, bright flower sticking in there, maybe even the upper right. So just a little camera movement has, uh, produced a more homogeneous green background, and now you pay attention to the subject more so than you were anything in the background in terms of, you know, bright colors or, um, or uh, just brightness. Um, and here's a sequence by Elizabeth Stone, who took a pic picture of this butterfly or moth, I think it might be. Um, here's the first shot, and then she just made a little shift with her camera and found a better background, much nicer. Um, here's a little Indian paintbrush that I was shooting and, you know, a little whiteness in the background. So just a shift of a half an inch with my camera um, produced a much nice, softer background. 
beautiful, right? Um, here's a little sequence that Elizabeth shot as well. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, really white background. The berries and even some of the snow is kind of getting lost back there. So she did a little shift with her camera position and found a nice darker background um, to put behind there. And now the, the grains of the, um, the crystals of the ice are much more prominent and the berries kind of pop out of there too. Um, and all these shots, um, you know, nice simple backgrounds behind these daisies. This white flower. Nice soft background there. See how there's no distractions um, in these shots? And in this, a uh, little part to an old rusty um, pail. Nice softness in the background there, or behind this stamen. Parts of the flower. Pretty soft, but you can see that there, there's no distraction. It's it's all the same color, or behind this uh, center of this iris. Um, and certainly, it's kind of fun to look for stuff in the background too. If you don't want it purely homogenous, um, start to look for things that uh, support your subject. Um, like this, uh, this is a buttercup with a supporting buttercup. And when you think about composition. There's only, um, there's really um, five things or six things that you should consider to support your subject. You can support it in terms of its color, like these uh, buttercups, in terms of the shape, um, the texture, um, the color, certainly, um, and the brightness. So those are five simple things to think about when you, when you look for supporting subjects um, in any kinds of photography, really. But certainly macro too. So here's, a, here's an iris with some supporting irises behind them in the background, behind the prominent one in front, or this keyhole behind the doorknob that I focused on. Nice supporting idea. Um, and in this sequence, this is a, a background of a, this was a red sweater I put behind this, the, these uh, Gerber daisies and um, this is analogous, uh, red and yellow, orange are analogous colors. But to give it more pop, you could put something like that behind the same flower arrangement. Um, but constantly thinking about the background. And here, here we have nice complementary colors to support uh, the, the, the excitement of these um, little flowers that are kind of on the edge here. Um, so background, background, background. Remember, just once you define your subject, look at the background see how it supports the subject if you want to change it to just make it a wash of color. Um, so in here, a uh, couple uh, techniques that um, are kind of fun um, that uh, you can sort of get rid of your tripod, um, that thing that everybody loves and hates. Um, and so if you have lots of light, um, you can do what uh, this workshop participant taught me. You can focus with your toes. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> Well, it means that uh, basically you take your, your camera and you open up the aperture wide open to its widest. And what does that do? It allows you to shoot very fast to minimize some of the, what's going to take place in the hand holding. Um, and so with a fast shutter speed, you also focus as close as you can po possibly focus, you know, with a macro setup, extension tubes or a macro lens, um, and just leave the focus alone. You don't worry about it anymore. Just plop yourself down on your stomach with your camera up on, you know, with the elbows supporting the camera and just in amongst the grasses or flowers or whatever you're in. Um, and then basically, you, you, you know, find a, a, a various subjects and then just basically push with your toes and that moves your shoulders forward and the camera moves so that you're focusing in a different place and you just find one little edge of uh, sharpness and just in continuous shooting mode, just hold down the button and you're likely to get one shot that's probably sharp, maybe two, and a lot of them won't be. And those are the ones you throw out. But um, certainly, um, you know, it's, it, it frees you up and, and puts you into this world um, that's kind of whimsical and fun. And since you're on your stomach, if you get sleepy, um, then you can just roll over and take a nap, which is kind of fun as well. Uh, but here's a series of photographs I focused with my toes. Um, so here's just grasses pressed up against the lens. You can see the wash of green from the grasses 
and then just uh, focusing on some buttercups. As soon as I saw them, boom, I hit the shutter. Um, and like I said, continuous shooting mode, I got one shot that was sharp with parts of the flower. Or here's some just some little um, grasses um, with the sun behind it, kind of pretty. This is the inside of a dandelion, which is just moving through this big puffy um, dandelion, find, finding edges of things. Um, down in the grasses, a little bead of um, dew, kind of fun. And in this uh, shot, it was underneath some ferns on my back. And so when I pressed on my, pressed an, on the ground with my rear end, it pushed my shoulders forward. So I actually focused with my butt on this one, which is interesting. Um, another thing that I've tried, and it, it certainly I, you know, it shot macro for a few hours, and now I do this all the time. I was like, a, you know, a little tired and whatever. So I started to um, uh, do motion blurs on the inside of flowers, which is really fun. It became a, a body of work, and I sold some work at a gallery one time of the of these shots. And so you're basically just uh, stopping the lens down to get a slower shutter speed in this case and moving the camera inside of the flower or on the outside of the flower, filling the frame with just color. Um, so your shutter speeds are probably uh, half a second, quarter of a second, and you just move your camera just slightly to get that blur. Um, I don't even know what these flowers are, but um, they're just a wash of color, which is kind of fun. I really like that one. It looks like a horizon lying back there with the red. Um, this is the inside of a daisy, I think. Kind of fun. Iris. Colors of the iris. Not sure what this one is, but I like the color. So another technique that's kind of fun. And um, you don't have to worry about all that setup. Just get your camera uh, lens and um, camera ready to go. And then, um, and then just, you know, move inside of flowers. Um, another technique that I, I really have been doing a lot um, because I like the view is putting extension on a wide angle lens because it gives you that really wide view, but you have to get really close to something because the working distance is only about an inch. So normally the sun or the light source is somewhere out in front of you or on the side. It can't be near behind you or anything because you'll be blocking that sun. So here's just a little plant with the sun coming up with that uh, extension on a wide angle lens um, right here. Kind of pretty. Um, or uh, this little branch and there's a little secondary subject support back there with another little branch. Put a little frost on it. Getting pretty close to this leaf here. Or just really getting close to this iris. So kind of a fun technique um, and challenging, and that's why I like it. I like to be challenged a little bit. So just a couple techniques, and, um, you know, I, I talked a lot about gear, and I hope uh, some of the things that I discussed are you can consider to get close up. And, like, if we go back to these extension tubes, I'd really encourage any everybody to get these um, and just keep them in your bag because they'll help any lens get closer. And certainly you can get macro, capabilities one-to-one um, -one, that life size um, physical size of the of your subject um, to life size and um, they're inexpensive so um, and uh, I want to uh, end this with just a couple things a quote from Elliot Porter one of my favorite not macro photographers but uh, nature intimate nature photography um, he, he said a detail is quite capable of eliciting a greater intensity of emotion than the whole scene evoked in the first place, because the whole of nature is too vast and too complex to grasp quickly, but a fragment is comprehensible and it allows the imagination to fill the excluded setting. And I, I really like that. I think that uh, captures macro, the macro world in a, in a nice quote. And I'll also leave you with this. Um, just some suggested reads that I've really enjoyed and learned a lot from um, is John Shaw, who's uh, close-ups in nature. Um, he wrote before digital photography came to be, but um, a lot of the techniques are perfect um, for what, what we're talking about um, this evening. And then Nancy Rotenberg um, wrote a book on how to photograph close-ups in nature. Brilliant 
beautiful book. And John and Barbara Gerlich from um, Michigan, I do believe, um, they wrote a really nice book too. So I'll leave you with that. Um, and you can, uh, if you want to write those down, you can just view the um, YouTube video um, once this is done and pause there and write those down. So 